I thank you, God, that we have a, a warm, dry place to worship you. When it could be outside and it could be in a cave, it could be somewhere where we are fearful of authorities and fearful of other people. But we come openly this morning and we thank you for being able to worship this way. Help us to be just as serious in our worship as we would be otherwise. I thank you for each person that is here. Thank you for the day ahead of us, the service ahead of us. Pray that you would guide it and direct it, that we would honor you and glorify you throughout this time. And we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I found myself reflecting this past week on being thankful. Um, I would like to say I'm thankful every day, and some days I know that I don't do as well as others. But um, we had 21 people around our table, which meant you had to go through the living room to get to the one end of the table because it was that tight. But um, after our meal, we, we ran around the table and had each person say one thing they were thankful for. It didn't have to be the most thankful because sometimes that's hard to, to come up with. And it was just interesting with a cross... Um, with the, the different people, uh, sons, daughters, spouses, grandchildren, some from 16 down to one that couldn't express his thankfulness very well. And um, just to hear the perspective from each one on what we are thankful for. So I think it's good sometimes if we just stop and reflect on what we have to be thankful for. So I'm grateful that we can meet here this morning. I'm thankful that we have a uh, brotherhood and that brothers and sisters can meet together and worship together. Do you have any announcements that you would like to make this morning? We'll give you the mic if you do. The uh, ladies prayer group is at church this Thursday, December the 1st. Can you believe we're that close to December? Yes, you can. Okay. If there's no one, then we'll have Wendell come and lead us in our worship time. Good morning. Good morning. Our first two songs, I believe they'll be on the overhead. But you also can find them in the blue book, number 44. Did I write this down right? Yes, number 44 and then number 43. So, I love you, Lord, followed by thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. I love you, Lord. Songs of Life and Praise book, number 132, it's also on the overhead, Someone to Thank. I don't know that we've ever sung this song here, so it may be new for a number of you. Uh, we, we can sing it, we can learn it. Oh, it's a good Thanksgiving song. There is 
Thank you for singing out. Our next two songs will be in the hymnal, number 522, The God of Harvest Praise. <coughs> 522.
that is our desire this morning, the last line of the song. Bless ye the Lord. Doesn't matter if we come with a full harvest or maybe a, what we feel like might be a harvest lackey, but may we bless the Lord. Our last song, number 581, I am thine, O Lord. I invite you to stand for this song. This is a song of consecration, of giving ourselves to God, because he is worthy of our lives. 581. Thank you, Wendell. Thank you for singing out. I'd like to give opportunity this morning for any prayer requests that you may have. And I think before that, we have a number of visitors here this morning. So we would like to recognize the visitors. Someone that is here that knows you will stand up and 
and say who you are and we will give them that opportunity not to embarrass you but to welcome you and to put names to faces. So why don't we start over here, Daryl? Yes, we're thankful to have our family with us. Uh, our oldest son, Laverne, and his wife, Esther, and our grandchildren from Bedford, Pennsylvania. They were here for Thanksgiving. And our family has been together a lot the last few days, and we've really enjoyed it. We're blessed Good. to have them here. Thank you. You are welcome. Stan? We, uh, we spent the weekend... Uh, down at Crooked Creek for mom, celebrating mom's 94th birthday. And then most of the family is all back, uh, um, has gone. And then we had our niece Sophie here because she lives in San Antonio or Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, <laughs> so currently Des Moines, Iowa. Good. Welcome. It's good to see your smiling face. Esther? We have some good friends of ours here, Dan and Sylvester uh, Hall from Tiffin, from Tiffin, Tiffin. Iowa. Okay. Welcome. And Susie? We're privileged to have family here also. We have Linda and Randy from Ohio, our daughter Wanda. And at the end is Brooklyn, Jolene, our daughter, Jolene, and, and then uh, Cameron. And those are the two of our grandchildren that are here. Seems like a lively bunch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for that. Do you have any prayer requests this morning? We take those. Look in the bulletin and see who we're still with Lloyd and Joyce this Sunday yet, I believe. Henry? Praise the Lord. I enjoyed those songs. Uh, yeah, I just would like for your covet your prayers for Tuesday evening. I'll be leaving here and meeting up with some uh, brothers in Memphis, Missouri and going with them down to the prison crusade in North Florida. Okay. And then I'll be returning the 10th uh, with one of the other uh, instructors. And he's from Illinois, Arthur, Illinois. So if you happen to be in Illinois and you're coming home... <laughs> Uh, and I could catch a ride, and that would be a real blessing. Or if you're anywhere between Illinois and Florida, <laughs> on route there, why, just call me and see if we could connect something. If not, I'll just okay. get a vehicle. But uh, I just thought I'd make it a, you know, open it up for mm -hmm. somebody to happen to be going that way. Why, I might hitch a ride. <laughs> well, what date would that be? Uh, the 9th. December the 9th. Coming De December home. the 9th, yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you, Henry. Barry? Yeah, thank you so much for all the prayers that we've had for Debbie and I. And uh, she's about a third of the way through radiation now. She had a good week this week. Uh, Yesterday morning, her stepmother, Thelma, passed away in Virginia. And she's sad she can't go to that, but uh, it's good Thelma could go. She was suffering from dementia the last while, 93 years old. Um, also, uh, on the way to church this morning, I heard that, um, isn't it strange, as we mature in Christ, we don't need him less. We actually need him more. Mm -hmm. 
and just reminded me to continue to mature, continue to grow in our faith, but to continue realizing that means I need him more. Okay, Sam? I just wanted to share with you that we, I had a good visit with um, Marta this yesterday. We, we spent some time up at Coralville at the mall so she could spend time with her daughter. And it, was out, it went very well. And I was just asking for prayers as she heads for home this morning as, for safe travels. Say Marta's heading home. Okay. Any other prayer requests? We oh, I'm sorry. Right up front here, Emma. My heart goes out to Viola Hostetler. I just uh, think that we need to pray for her. This is, has to be a very traumatic experience for her to give up her sister, that has been her caretaker and and. Uh, she told me a couple months ago that she knows that one of these times Lydia will probably pass away and then she'll have to go to the home. And uh, I thought she did very well in accepting it, but I just, I just think we need to pray for her and lift her up. Thank you. Okay. Reminds me there is a, maybe Wendell, you could, your aunt, great aunt Lydia, right? Yeah, so my great aunt Lydia Ho Sudler, who had passed away. Um, visitation will be today from 2 to 6, and the funeral is tomorrow at 10 at Fairview. Um, this would be Jonas's sister as well as Martha Helmuth's sister. So there's a connection to our congregation. And so we would do well in remembering Jonas's and also Martha in this time. So Lydia's visitation is at Yoder Powell, is that correct? I think so. Okay. Two to six today, and then Fairview tomorrow. Okay. Dan. Yeah, uh, on Thanksgiving Day, Edie's oldest brother passed away in Pennsylvania. So we'll be, his service will be next Sunday afternoon. So we'll appreciate prayers for our travels out there and for the rest of their family. What's her brother is Arthur. Uh, he was 73 years old. And Arthur's wife is surviving him. Is that correct? Okay. All right. We have a number of requests. Um, continue to pray for Lloyd and Joyce. And Henry going to, is it Alabama? Florida. Florida. Okay. <laughs> Prison crusades. <coughs> Barry's, Debbie's radiation, also the death of her stepmom. And Sam gave expression about praying for Marta on her way back. We have Susie Hosteller, Martha. Helmuth and uh, Lydia's family, which would include Martha, but also Myron's here and uh, others that are online, uh, Jonas and Ann. Um, Dan's as they travel. And then Edie's brother, Arthur, passed away, so be praying for his wife and family. I have something I would like to read this morning. Um, it's kind of given as a public expression because of a public expression last Sunday here. And I would just like to give it as God's word and um, have us think about it, pray about it, um, read the scriptures that I give. The scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture, all scripture, is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, 
thoroughly equipped for every good work. And then in, in 2 Peter 1, a couple of verses, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Prophecy never, never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The, um, there's a scripture from John 16, 13, and I take this out of my doctrines of Bible. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, together with the gospel of Jesus Christ, is here set forth in emphatic form. Sometimes people profess to have received some spirit revelation which teaches them something different from that which the Word of God teaches. The references just quoted refute such false claims. The word of God and the spirit of God agree in all things, for he cannot be a true God and contradict himself. Let's have a time of prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the clarity of your word. I thank you, God, that, that it does not contradict you in any way, that you are a God that is not set up as God or Son, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in any kind of a hierarchical manner, but instead it's like a round circle where we see each one of you in unity with each other, and I thank you that we can trust you for that. I thank you, God, for the prayer requests that have been given for Lloyd and Joyce as they continue to serve you, and pray for Henry as he goes to Florida and is part of a, a prison revival crusade Pray for Barry's and Deb's treatments, also the death of her stepmom and what that all entails, whether they can go or not, and whether um, the family can get together. We just pray for, for comfort in the sense of having, in some, some ways, lost Thelma uh, when she um, gave in to dementia, when that she lost her mind. So we just pray that you would guide them and Give them good memories of good times together with her and Debbie's dad. Pray for Marta and her travels. Pray for her and Sam and their relationship, first of all with you and then with each other. Pray for Susie Hostetler, her physical needs, Martha Helmuth as well, and also having lost a sister. And I pray that you would just um, be with her in a very special way and being able to attend. Pray that for Jonas and the rest of the family as well, and also for them as they get together this afternoon, that you would be with them, and, and just being able to grieve for Lydia and also have sharing good memories of her life here. Pray for Dan and Edie as they travel, and for um, her brother Arthur's wife and family as they also grieve and have good memories of the times together uh, when before there was sickness and illness in the family, and also during that time as well. I pray that you would guide and direct this service. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to have you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Starting in verse 18, I would like to read this to the end of the chapter, and then Marv will come forward and we'll have a word of prayer together. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. 
But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Marv, if you want to come forward, we'll have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for Marv. I thank you for the message you've laid on his heart, for the things that he speaks. This morning, I pray that we would be open to hear from you, first and foremost, that you would be honored and glorified in this message, in each one of our lives, that you would give Marv strength and wisdom and direction, that you, God the Holy Spirit, would fill him with your unction and power, that your word would be lifted up and honored this morning. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll get, <clears throat> we'll get to that later. All right, thank you for reading that scripture. We'll be looking in the book of James again. And the last part of chapter 3 talks about wisdom. And so I had Brother Floyd read in 1 Corinthians 1 here that talked about wisdom and talked about the foolishness of this world and comparing that to God and how that there's just no really no good comparison because God is so much greater. So in my Bible, I have a little, <clears throat> I'll have a little heading over top of this, uh, these last verses in James 3, starting at verse 13. It says two kinds of wisdom, and I wasn't sure was it two or was it four kinds of wisdom. So we'll look at that. Uh, there's definitely a wisdom that comes from above, and there's a wisdom that does not come from above. And then those three that don't come from above uh, are actually earthly, that's one of them, and another one is sensual, and another one is devilish. And it seems like they keep going lower in, you know, in degradation, they get lower. I mean, we think about, uh, well, we'll get to that a little bit later. But the, the Greek word for wisdom is Sophia. Actually... I think it might be pronounced Sophia. But <laughs> so, so actually, a name uh, for, for wisdom is, is Sophia. And we know it as a girl's name. So it's a good name. Uh, another good name that we'll be looking at later is peace. And in Greek, it's Irene. But it's spelled like Irene with an E in front of it. It's Irene. And the E's have an A sound there. And so uh, it's also it's peace. Uh, we think about shalom being peace as well. It's another word for peace, but uh, it's also a good name. So I want to, to look at Luke chapter 16 just a little bit, starting at verse 8 to 13, before I read in James, because this talks about an earthly wisdom. Okay? And so it's, it's the dishonest steward, if you remember that story. Let's turn to it in, in Luke 16, and then we'll come back to James. Luke chapter 16, starting at verse 13. It says, No servant can serve two masters. Make sure I got the right one. There we go. I think I want, I want to start at verse 8 and end at verse 13. Let me back up. Starting at verse 8. 
The master, you remember the story how he told those that uh, owed money to his lord, his master, to reduce the debt, to write it down as a lower. Okay, so then in verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted wisely or shrewdly. How many of, of you have employees? Okay. Uh, if your employees would uh, decide that they would just tell the person that owes you money to write down on their paper, you know, instead of $100, make it 50 would you be pleased? You wouldn't. You would be. <laughs> you know, and, and so... Uh, he, he commended him, though, for the way he acted because he realized what was happening. So let, let me keep reading. He had acted shrewdly. I'm reading from the NIV. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. Now, the shrewdness is not necessarily a good thing, but they, they, they was, he was acting wisely in a worldly sense. Not a, not a heavenly sense, but in a worldly sense, or not in a godly sense. But I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Let's see, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest in very little or will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been, and if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so... His Lord, I found it fascinating that his Lord commended him for his actions, for his, for his, for his earthly wisdom. Uh, I thought he'd have probably chewed him out, you know, or, or, you know, called him on the carpet or whatever you want to call it. Uh, how do they, why do they come up with that phrase, calling him on the carpet? Is there going to be a wrestling match? Or, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's phrases we use. I don't know why. Uh, but I noticed that, that in the Greek... The Greek word in Luke for wisdom or for being wise is a different word than what is used in James. And so we are not quite comparing apples to apples uh, with this wisdom. So this, this shrewd uh, servant here was not using the same kind of wisdom that James talks about. And I think that uh, in James it means the ability to make good judgments and quick decisions in a godly way. And I think that, uh, that, that as we mature as Christians and become more mature, we should be able to more quickly make godly choices and be able to understand that this pleases God or this does not. I mean, we don't always know, but I think it should become uh, more readily. It should be quicker that we could discern that, I think, as we mature. So we wrestle sometimes uh, when we know what we should do, but our flesh sees an advantage in, in a different way, and, and we shouldn't have to wrestle with that. We should always choose God's way, but yet we, we do at times. We have to wrestle with that, and, and we have to wrestle with that earthly wisdom. This, this shrewd uh, servant here didn't wrestle with it. He just went ahead and did it. And it gained him friends that were probably able to kind of help him out when he was without a job, which I think he lost his job because of what he did. Uh, but anyway, that's an earthly wisdom. So a college professor would come into a class, and as he was teaching or lecturing, he would put a, he would put a tennis ball up on his podium. And he never said why. People didn't ask. But one day, and I'm looking, I don't see anybody sleeping, but one day somebody went to sleep, and he took that tennis ball and he threw it and hit him on the head. Class dismissed. He didn't lick a, didn't miss a lick. Next day he comes back. <laughs> they said nobody fell asleep the rest of that semester. <laughs> so is that earthly wisdom? 
You think it's, is it heavenly wisdom? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, we do all kinds of things with earthly wisdom. I mean, God gives us wisdom. We do. I mean, I thought <clears throat> that professor was pretty shrewd. I mean, I think he used some earthly wisdom. I'll put this away so you don't feel threatened. <laughs> but but we, we use earthly wisdom to our advantage. And I think that, that God gives us earthly wisdom, but then there's the spiritual wisdom that's much more important that should govern our lives. And I think that's what James is talking about. So <coughs> I, think, uh, I think we need to turn to James and, and look at these, these kinds of wisdom. And, and it says two kinds of wisdom. But it says in verse, uh, we'll start at verse 13 and go to the end of the chapter. So it says, who is wise and understanding among you? Well, I don't know. Do we look around or do we look inward? How do we, I mean, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life and by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. So there's a couple of things I notice here that... uh, one of them is that we should be wise. We should be understanding. There should be those people among us. We should be that person, ourselves. We should be wise and understanding. And then it says, let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. And I think in the King James it talks about works. Am I right? I think it talks about works there. It's out, oh, there you go, thank you. Pointing up here. <clears throat> let, him show, let him show it out of a good conversation, his works with meekness of wisdom. And so the wisdom that is from above, we will look at it just a little bit more, but we notice a couple things about that wisdom. There's a humility or a meekness that comes with that wisdom. And there's works that go with that wisdom. So now I know that we earlier in James looked at faith and works. And here is another place where works comes up. So in other words, the way that we live our lives, the things that we do affect our wisdom. It affects us because it comes out of of who we are. It comes out of us. And so when we have wisdom, we need to be able to display that. It affects the way that we live. And the conversation uh, of, of our life is not, is not the idea of talking, but it's, it's an older English word that, that has to do with, with uh, by the way that we live, actually. And so we look at wisdom in that way. The next verse, 14, But if you harbor envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Would we admit to harboring anything like this? Would we have bitter envying and strife in our hearts? Would we admit to that? Can it happen? Sometimes it can. Sometimes it does. Uh, but it says, glory not and lie not against the truth. In other words, don't, don't boast about it. Don't feel like that's a good thing. But at the same time, don't deny it either. I mean, we should look at it for what it is. And then we should, I believe, deal with it uh, uh, for what it is. Because that is, uh, well, it says in the next verse, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and of the devil. That sounds pretty, pretty serious. You know, wisdom, you know, that, that is, is coming out of, out of harboring bitterness, or envy in our heart and strife, those kinds, of, those kinds of emotions and attitudes coming out of us are not wisdom that's from above. They're not a godly wisdom. And it's not wise to have those kinds of attitudes. And so we should, we should uh, have an attitude of wisdom that comes with humility. Earthly wisdom would have to do with things of the earth or this world. We might call it a worldly wisdom. The sensual, uh, it's a second one. We might say there's, there's like three degrees of, of <laughs> stronger or, or less godly attitudes. I don't know if you'd call them that. It's, you know, the first one is the earthly or the worldly one. The second one, the sensual one, 
is, is of a natural nature because we do have a sinful nature. And, and so that can tend to come out as well, a sensual nature. And that kind of wisdom, uh, it's not, in the Greek, it's not talking about the higher nature. It's not talking about uh, the lower nature. It's just talking about our natural nature. Uh, that's something that we have to contend with. Uh, it says, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but, and this would be what we would call uh, an ungodly or, a, or at least a non, non-godly wisdom. Those are, those are wisdoms that are in, of themselves not wrong, but they're not, they're not a godly wisdom. But then the very last one is devilish. And that we know comes from hell. And, and I know that Satan would many times uh, try to, to make us feel wise, I guess, and use it for his glory or to, to bring strife or to bring all those other kinds of things that would tear uh, apart the church of Christ or tear down the name of God. There's all kinds of ways that he can do that, that third degree, that envying, it can come. And, and I know that the, the devil brings strife and confusion, and he wants to do that. Uh, he does it many times, and, and I would say let's be careful that we don't participate in that. And it's hard to know sometimes how to do that, and we can get caught up in it without realizing it as, as well. I can at times. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Or it says confusion. Where, there, where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. So now when there's envy and strife, it's not the wisdom that comes from above. It's either the earthly, the sensual, or the devilish wisdom. And so there you see where it, what it does. There's envying, there's strife, there's confusion, and every evil work. And so this kind of wisdom is, is not the godly wisdom. And so we say, well, is it wise? then is it wise? Would you call it wisdom? (laughs) The earthly wisdom might have been a good thing. Uh, The shrewd manager, I mean, he lost his job but he had some friends that probably were willing to help him because, because he had actually had, at that point yet, had the legal authority to lessen their bill. And I believe it stood. I don't believe that the manager or that the owner actually went back and added it back to their bill because he had given legal authority to this person to do that work. And so, so the manager had to, the owner had to take the loss. And, and he, I still find it fascinating that he commended this man for acting that way. Because I'm thinking, well, that's not godly. You're stealing from your employer. And, and yet in earthly wisdom, it benefited him. And so you recognize the difference between godly wisdom and earthly wisdom. People do many things that benefit them, but it's not godly. It can be earthly or sensual. And... Uh, Envying, I, I looked up what does envying mean. It means the Greek, the Greek word for envy or jealousy is heat. So it's like a zeal or it's a passion. It's a deep, it's a deep emotion. Uh, it can be a zeal in a good sense, or if it's in a negative sense, it's a jealousy. Did you know that God is a jealous God? I don't know if that's negative. Because... Uh, but God also is a jealous God, and he can get passionate about that. He was jealous for his own people. In fact, at one point he said, my name is jealous. Would you like a name like that? I think I'd rather have Sophia. <laughs> you know, or, or Irene. You know, and we're looking at names. Uh, but jealous, I mean, God is a jealous God. And so with that, with that heat or that passion uh, that God has, uh, it can be in a good sense. But it can cause contention and strife. And in, in this verse, in the context, it's a bad sense. Uh, this, this, this strife or this, this envying here, this heat uh, or uh, jealousy is, is, a, is in a bad sense as far as in the context here. 
And when it causes strife, uh, it says if these attitudes are true in our life, we should, we, should, we should not feel exalted or boastful. And we shouldn't say that they don't exist, or we shouldn't try to deceive by falsehood and say, oh, no, not in my life. I don't feel that way when it's true. But if we back up a verse, you know, I think when we know it's true, we shouldn't deny it. Uh, and so I think that we need to just recognize that it's, it's good to just be honest about where we are. Sometimes we're not where we should be. We need to honestly examine ourselves and then realign our attitude to reflect the wisdom that God desires us to show. So there's three degrees of this attitude listed. So I don't know. Does it look like it to you? I'm not here to refute my little my little line, two kinds of wisdom. So uh, I put. I wondered if it was four kinds, but anyway, uh, it's not actually the little heading I have in my Bible. It was not part of Scripture. It was man's topic thing for the next paragraph or whatever. So those three degrees uh, that I that are listed here, and I think that uh, the Satan will use our fleshly weaknesses to wreak havoc if he can. So let's, uh, let's try not to do that. So it's like, wow, we started looking at a wise man with knowledge, earthly knowledge. Well, actually in James here, we started looking at a wise man with godly, one, godly knowledge. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life or by his deeds or his work done in humility that comes from wisdom. So let's do that. Then we looked at some wisdom that comes from a wrong attitude. What is the comparison? Who do you want to be? Which kind of wisdom do you want to display in your life? I think it's good to just reflect a bit and say, do I have the godly wisdom that I would want to show th from my life? And there's times when my flesh... Uh, springs up and it doesn't show it doesn't show the wisdom that God would have it doesn't show the humility and and it it doesn't and, and actually uh, we'll look at it even even a little more uh, in just a little bit and, and as, as I was studying uh, it talked about the confusion there's confusion in every evil work and I looked up that word confusion what is confusion I don't even know if I wrote down the word. I don't think I wrote down the Greek word. But confusion is the idea of, of not being sure, you know, what, what's right. Or, or you just have a confusion. And, and I, was, I, I looked at it and I thought, wow. Because I looked at the, the last part of the verse, which I didn't even read yet, talks about peacemakers and, and, and sowing peace. And I'm thinking, wow, confusion and peace in the same, in the same paragraph, it looks like they're opposites. How do you have confusion and peace? And then I, I was looking up confusion, and I think it was used four times. Uh, and Paul used it. In, in 1 Corinthians 14, he actually used it. And I, would think, I was thinking, in the context of the gifts of the Spirit, I wouldn't have expected to find confusion there, but yet it was at that point. And so it just says that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And it's like, wow, it talks about peace as as well as what James does here just a little bit later and there's a peace there and and I think that in well in the context of 1 Corinthians 14 confusion happens when when there was a speaking of tongues in the church without an interpretation and so I want to just use a little bit of time for the teaching I think on that I haven't done that for a long time it doesn't seem like but in, in speaking in tongues it is the Holy Spirit that gives that gift why does he, and I've wondered, why does the Holy Spirit give us speaking in tongues? Because when they're speaking in tongues, he wants an interpretation. So why doesn't he just give the interpretation and we could speak it in English and skip the tongues? You know, I've wondered, but God didn't choose to do it that way. Now, prophecy is spoken in a language we understand. And so it's given to the church and they are, they are edified. And so if there's speaking in tongues and there's an interpretation given, then there's also edification of the church. I'm thinking, well, God, why did you, why did you choose to do it that way? And, and when it all comes down to it, I don't know all the whys. But there are some things that I think that we can gather from that. 
And so looking at the confusion, God doesn't want it to be confusing. And, and so, uh, let me see, I'm looking at my notes here. Did you know that tongues can be assigned to unbelievers? That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 14. It can be assigned to unbelievers. Although if an unbeliever would come and it says and everybody would speak in tongues, they would think we're crazy or mad. I mean, and, and because it wouldn't make any sense to them. And, and that would be true. I mean, it wouldn't make sense to them. And although Paul was, was confident that he spoke in tongues more than all of them, or any of them, yet he says in the church he'd rather speak five intelligible words that teach than 10,000 in an unknown tongue that people wouldn't understand. And that's the value of hearing a spoken word that you can understand. It's, it's, it's a high value. And if the Holy Spirit wants to use the gift of tongues, then I'm pretty confident that he also wants to have an interpretation so that it will edify the church. And, and I'm comfortable with the Holy Spirit doing that. Uh, I think that we, we, if a person speaks in tongues, we could pause and, and see if the Lord would give an interpretation. Because if there is an interpretation, it will edify someone. And I think it should edify the church. And, and I don't know. Uh, God does many different things, I believe, with that. We can't put God in a box. But uh, I want to look at just a few things that I think that speaking in tongues uh, does. It, it edifies the one who is praying. It specifically says that. But just, just me coming in and edifying myself by speaking in tongues and praying wouldn't edify you. I should do that at home. I should do that in private. And, and Paul was, would say he, he does that. But then uh, he says his understanding is unfruitful when he speaks in tongues. He doesn't even understand what he's praying. But he's edified. And so he's praying and he recognizes he's praying, but he doesn't know what he's praying for. Or, or even singing. He talks about singing in the Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit may be interceding for someone through your prayer. Or he may be speaking mysteries. The Bible talks about that. He may be speaking mysteries. Or he may be praising or blessing or giving thanks. He could do all those things. It mentions these things that he may be doing when he's speaking in tongues. And tongues is a language. Somebody can understand it. Either someone from a different language or different place in the world than we live, or it could be the tongues of angels it talks about. And I wondered, well, would God have us speak things that angels can understand? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he would. I, I, I don't know that. But if he gives us an interpretation, then, then, uh, then, there's, then there's an understanding, and then we could say Amen. If it's, a, if it's a word from the Lord. I wonder, does God want to use our lips to speak for him while for some reason not letting us in on the understanding part of it? I, don't, I, can't, understand, I, can't, I can't give you a definite answer on that. And so I don't understand at all. So uh, I know that I have heard of times when people have spoken a language that they did not learn. They were speaking in a tongue in a different language that the Holy Spirit gave them that spoke to a person and they were able to hear the words of God when the person speaking did not know what he was saying. I read a book here recently about, uh, I think I might have mentioned it once, not this aspect of it, a uh, missionary that was in the jungles of South America, Brazil, I don't remember, I'm trying to remember, Colombia maybe, uh, can't you remember the name of it right now? Somebody might know. But he was, the, these people somehow came to know that Jesus was the Christ and that he was Lord and they came to trust in him. Even with their limited uh, knowledge of Jesus, they trusted in him and they were saved. And they went to their former enemies, well, at this point, still their enemies, and shared with them the gospel. Now this missionary had had enough uh, correspondence or enough studying about this other group knowing that their languages were enough different they couldn't, they couldn't talk to each other. <clears throat> Excuse me, they couldn't understand each other. And this man came home and he shared with the missionary. He says, we told them about Christ. And they believed. He said, well, how do you know they believed? Because they told us. 
And he's saying, well, how could they, how could you, he didn't, he didn't ask this man, but he was in his own mind. He was wondering, well, how could they, how could they understand each other? And I was wondering to myself, well, I wonder if that wasn't a gift that the Holy Spirit was giving that they could speak and understand each other. And it was if they knew the same language. And I don't, I don't know. But the Holy Spirit can do that because he knows all languages. He knows all the languages of angels. And I don't know if angels have more than one language or not. I wouldn't think so, but I don't know. Talked about the tongues of men and of angels. So I, I don't know. God has given me the gift of speaking in tongues, but I've never felt like I had a gift of interpretation. I've prayed for interpretation. I've never had one. And, and I know that I've heard people say, you know, it's just like the words came to them. They knew exactly what was said, even though they didn't understand it. The Holy Spirit just gave it to them. Some thought it was, felt like it was a screen, you know, like they could just see the words. And others just felt like they knew the message. They just knew it because the Holy Spirit gave it to them. And, and I haven't had that. And so I don't speak in tongues pu publicly. I, I'd, if God would tell me to, I trust I would, but he, you know, I don't know that I don't feel like he has. I guess he'd have to just lay it on my heart pretty heavy. But, but God does do that. And I want you to know that the Holy Spirit can still do that. He can still heal. He can still use those gifts and, and, uh, that the Holy Spirit gives. I believe he can use them today. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. In uh, 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5. I hear pages rustling. I'll wait just a little bit. <coughs> I'll back up to verse 4. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. And so edification is the purpose here that the Holy Spirit wants, I think. Is that what you're talking about? Well, three he's in that verse. Okay. Okay, uh, I would rather he who's prop. Uh, wait, which I'm not sure if I'm understanding. He yeah. That's referring to the one that prophesied. Right. And then it says he who speaks in tongues. Mm -hmm. And then the next he is referring to the one that was speaking in tongues. Okay. That's the revelation. Okay. And see that when the church is edified. Then there, was, then there was a building up of their faith. I think there was a building up inside of knowing that the Lord had spoken. And see, it can be a sign. And, and when, when we're here, let me just, let me just leave my, my Bible open here to 1 Corinthians 14. Just a little bit. Uh, Maybe, uh, maybe I've got a few minutes. If you'll, if, I'll cut it off here pretty soon. If you Sunday school teachers, I don't think I'm going to go over. Let me, let me just read this. Let me, let me start in, in verse 1. Follow the way of love or charity and, and eagerly, des, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Why, why is prophecy so important? Well, think about that as we read down through here. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. So when there's a prophecy, it should strengthen them, it should encourage them, or it should comfort them. And I think that when there's a, 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 a tongues and an interpretation given, I believe it accomplishes the same kind of edification. Okay. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. 
Now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? So those are things that could happen. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as the flute or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and he is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. Now what are all the gifts? We would have to go back to chapter 12. There's a message of wisdom. There's a message of knowledge. There's faith. There's gifts of healing. There's gift of miracles. Uh, gift of prophecy. And the ability to distinguish between spirits, discernment would be that one, and speaking in, in tongues and interpretation of tongues. So I think there's nine of them if I counted them right just now. These are things that the Holy Spirit would give. And they're not, they're not something that we can know of ourselves. You understand that they come, these come from the Holy Spirit. Wisdom from the Holy Spirit is not an earthly wisdom. Knowledge from the Holy Spirit is not an earthly knowledge. It's revealing things to us that we don't otherwise know. It's a gift of knowledge. It's a gift of wisdom. And we understand some of the more uh, miraculous gifts like healing, uh, those kinds of things. You know, it's like you could see those happen if the Lord does those things. But then the gift of faith, it's something, it's more than just a little faith. I mean, the gift of faith is a lot of faith. The Holy Spirit gives some people a, a, that, that gift of faith, uh, whether it's for all time or for a segment or one thing they're going through, he gives, he gives that. Uh, miracles, you know, prophecy, and discernment of spirits, and speaking in tongues and interpreting tongues. Those are things the Holy Spirit does. Those are not things that come from a natural man. When they're done for the glory of God, these are, these are things that God <clears throat> does through the Holy Spirit. Okay, the Holy Spirit does these. Let me keep going. Uh, where did I stop? I think somewhere here. Excel in the gifts that build up the church, verse, uh, verse 15. For this reason, the man who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving, since he does not know what you are saying? You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. <clears throat> Excuse me, so that's one thing that, that can be done. You're giving thanks during this time. Uh, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words of, to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants. But in your thinking, be adults. In the law, it is written, Through men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people. But even then, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues, then, are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all, and the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, ex exclaiming, God is really among you. 
So God wants people to understand what is being said. I mean, in the church, especially. In, in our, when, our, when, our, when we get together, that's what God wants us to do. Well, that's, that's, that's confusing. I want to get back, I want to get back, uh, back to James. <clears throat> the higher wisdom... Uh, I, let, me, let me back up just a little bit here to First Corinthians. I, I know that I have heard interpretations already that were, were so generic that at times I wondered, was that really the Holy Spirit? I mean, was he, is he always giving the same interpretation? Is he always saying the same thing? I mean, I will bless you or I love you or something. Is it always generic? Or wouldn't the Holy Spirit, if he wants to edify the church, give some specific message? And, and it's up to the Holy Spirit. But I wonder if he doesn't sometimes give a specific message to instruct or to encourage uh, those kinds of things. Uh, and I think, that, I think that he would, but, uh, but he can do it for whatever purpose he wants to. So it can be a word from the Lord. I believe it could be an instruction or direction for an individual or for the church as a whole. It could be praise or blessing or giving of thanks. I mean, these are all scriptural, I believe. Uh, the Holy Spirit can... can, can can do what he wants. He's God. But I think it will be, it will be in an orderly way, and it won't be confusing. And uh, all right, well, let me leave that alone. Uh, James, back to James chapter 3. Hopefully that wasn't confusing, because it's a confusion if I were trying to get rid of. <laughs> but, uh, but wisdom, we don't, want, we don't want confusion. God doesn't want confusion in the church. And godly wisdom isn't confusing, uh, for a Christian at least. You know, it may not be understood by a non, non-Christian or an unbeliever, um, but even then he should be able to understand what's being said so that, that he's convinced of truth. And so James says uh, in verse, and, and I want to look at verse 17, uh, and the difference, the difference between verse 16 and 17 is huge. The one is an earthly or sensual or devilish wisdom. The other one is a wisdom from heaven. But he says in verse 17, But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. That's the first thing. The wisdom from heaven is pure. And I'm thinking, why does he say first of all pure, then peace loving? Some people want to make peace, but they don't want to bring truth or, or purity into it. Well, that doesn't work. You have, to have the, you have to have the truth. You have to have the purity of, of what it is. Uh, wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving. It's considerate. It's submissive. It's full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. So if I look at this translation, the wisdom that is from above is first of all pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Look how different that is from the one of confusion and strife and envying. It's a lot of difference, isn't it? Wisdom from above has a, has a totally different spirit than, than earthly wisdom. It wants to bring in, it loves peace. Godly wisdom, heavenly wisdom, it's peaceable, and it's gentle. And so the, the, the attitude that we come with is not just forcing our way in. It's, it's actually gentle. It's easy to be entreated. In other words, hey, you know, I don't have all the answers. You know, you can entreat me. And as a pastor, I feel that way. I can be entreated. I'm, I want to be approachable. It's full of mercy. Wisdom from heaven or from above is full of mercy. And full of good fruits. And it's, it's without partiality and without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy would be, you know, saying one thing would be in something different. You know, there, there's none of that in, in, in heavenly wisdom. Peacemakers, verse 18. Peacemakers who sow in peace... Raise a harvest of righteousness. So heavenly wisdom includes being peaceable, but making peace or sowing peace reminds me of a farmer. 
You go out in the springtime and you, and you sow seed, you sow peace. And comes autumn, comes fall and the harvest, and all of a sudden you go out and, and it, it's interesting. Uh, you're not going to sow peace, you're going to sow righteousness. <laughs> I don't know how that worked. But it looks like it. I mean, if you, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. I guess it depends how you kind of word, the, word the, uh, the sentence. It says in this version that I'm reading from the NIV, Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. And so righteousness and peace go hand in hand. Righteousness and peace. It comes from wisdom that that God wants to give. So in conclusion, there's these different kinds of wisdom. But the one from above is the one that we really want to have. Uh, And I just noticed the contrast, uh, the bold contrast between verses 16 and 17. And so... I believe all of us as Christians want to have the wisdom that verse 17 talks about. So I would encourage you to sow peace and to reap righteousness and use that godly wisdom and pray for wisdom. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for godly wisdom. There's times when we pray for wisdom and we are exhorted to pray for wisdom if we lack it. And it says that you will give it liberally. Father, there's times when we face something when we don't know what godly wisdom is. And we don't want to just use worldly wisdom. We don't want to just guess. And so we look to you for wisdom, God. And I thank you that, that you can give wisdom. And I look at all the marks of godly wisdom. And it's pure. And it's peace-loving. It's considerate submissive, full of mercy and good fruit. It's impartial and sincere. Lord, as I see your attitude uh, coming into our lives as we administer godly wisdom, Father, it's, it's not that we have an envy now. It's not that we can boast. It's not that we feel like we're better than someone. We're impartial. We just want to share what you have given us. And I thank you that we can credit you with that wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. May the Sunday school superintendent come. Thank you, Marv, for the word from James. Um, today's offering is for uh, the ministers, and also the Sunday school offering is Gospel Echoes. Let's let's pray for that, and then also pray for the Sunday school. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ministers, the leadership team, the things that they provide for us. We thank you for that, and we pray that you would give them a good week and a good month. And we pray now for the offering as we give it, that it would be um, something that would bless them. And also we pray for the offering for the Gospel Echoes and their continued ministry that they do as far as predominantly with prisons. And so, so guide, guide that offering too. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The uh, children and the teachers and the superintendent to the basement can be dismissed. And... Um, I guess a little bit of a side note about offerings. Last Sunday's offering was for Brotherhood Prison Ministry, which is involved with what Calvin did at Oakdale. And I thought I'd give you an update on that. There's been some changes. And so down the road, our offerings may, we aren't real sure how that's all going to flesh its way out. And you, Calvin could correct me or I wrote some stuff down and I hope I'm accurate. But you try to get it concise and you don't cover it all. So, But um, this is in relation to when we have Brotherhood Prison Ministries offerings, which is um, when you give to Brotherhood Prison Ministries, that money goes to paying for Bible study material from Gospel Echoes, Gospel Express, and other Bible studies. It also goes for the purchasing of reward Bibles that are given to prisoners who complete Bible studies. 
These Bible studies are offered at Oakdale and other prisons in Iowa. A high percentage of these Bible studies and all the reward Bibles are purchased for Oakdale. Those expenses will continue, but due to state policy, there will be less input from volunteers within the prison. Where volunteers could promote the use of the Bible studies, now it will be limited. There will re they're really limiting the activity of volunteers, not giving them the freedom to go into the prison unsupervised. This is just provided, almost, regardless of what kind of volunteering you're doing, it's really uh, changed. The use of the Bible studies will continue, but it will rely much more on the inmates promoting it. The end result of these new policies will be reduced Bible studies and reward Bibles being given to inmates. Just for a uh, note, I look back how many reward Bibles were actually given, and it's quite significant. March, there was 109. April, there was 187. and May, there was 122. Um, those were people that completed a certain... They met the criteria, then they got a reward Bible. Um, and this is a little further note. Larry Sakora, one of the main volunteers working at Oakdale, uh, if he did what he used to do, the chaplain would need to close the chapel and go with him. That's where the supervision goes. So he'd have to close it, and he kind of ties the chaplain's hands up just by doing that. Um, it really curtails the effectiveness of what volunteers can do. Because of this, Larry is reducing his volunteering and will probably stop and look to other prisons to continue doing the kind of work that he prefers to do. I share this to keep you current on Brotherhood Prison Ministries, what Brotherhood Prison Ministries is facing. It will probably change their needs for offerings in the future. There are short-term money needs, but long-term is up in the air. Is that kind of accurate, Eric Calvin? Correct. Okay. So um, they are limiting... They're, they're letting different volunteers come in, but it's like once every two weeks they can, and it has to cover this area, and then, uh, yes? That's only to preach. Oh, to preach, okay. Oh, okay, every two weeks someone can come in. Okay. Okay, just in the chapel service, too, so. So there is changes, and then we're supposed to have a meeting later again, and find out how this is flushing itself out a little bit more, I guess. So that's kind of where that's at. But anyway. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our Heavenly Father, we, we pray for the needs of Brother of Prison Ministry and for the Oakdale Prison and the other prisons that this is probably also affecting them. Um, guide. Guide those on the outside that want to be a part and those on the inside. We pray that your hand would be really evident on the lives of, of the staff and the inmates, I guess. You just, just guide in that and, and uh, pray that your spirit would be truly present there. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now for uh, the Sunday school lesson. Uh, we have another lesson from Ruth. This is the third one. I thought it was... I you know Ruth is a lot is how would you say some of the other judges you kind of wonder what some of the you know stuff that goes on Ruth is kind of easier for you to <laughs> it's a good story and it's more than that but here's some thoughts that I have um, another lesson from Ruth uh, lesson from Ruth Ruth and Boaz wait the high character of Naomi Ruth and Boaz in this passage stands out. There is humility, obedience to God, faithfulness, and genuine love. They care about the people around them. Even when Boaz knows what he wants to do, he makes sure that he does it carefully in the presence of others. Boaz lived within the confines of acceptable Jewish behavior, and out of that, there was freedom. There was proper ways to treat people, and he lived according to those principles. You don't read anything about blowback to the fact that Ruth was a Moabite. We know this is a love story which ultimately brings Boaz and Ruth together in marriage. Even if Boaz and Ruth didn't end up getting married, wouldn't this still be a story on how to treat people? I think so. I guess I'll leave you at that. So.